Today on the Emmanuel Pulpit. If you got a salvation that delivered you from hell without turning you from sin, that experience is as fake as a $3 bill and a $4 Gucci handbag. It won't last in the judgment. It won't get you into the kingdom of God. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. This past week, the running world was shocked by news of a major cheating scandal. It involved a world-famous ultra-marathon runner by the name of Kelly Agnew. Now, if you don't know that name, there's good reason for that. Kelly Agnew literally ran onto the scene of ultra-marathons as recently as 2011, and nobody within that sport had really even heard of him prior to that. He was not a world-renowned 5K, 10K, 15K runner and winner. He had not made a name as a winner of half marathons or uh, world-renowned marathons. But all of a sudden, when it comes to these ultra-marathons, races of 100 miles or more, he was clocking off first-place victories like nobody's tomorrow. People began to be suspicious. How does somebody with no background in professional running win all of these races? Agnew's best event was what's called a fixed time race. In other words, rather than seeing who can run a certain distance the fastest, a fixed time race picks the time of, say, 24, 48, 72 hours. One recent race was six days long, and the idea is how far can you run in that fixed time? length of time. Agnew was well on his way to winning a three-day, 72-hour ultramarathon in Phoenix, Arizona when they discovered he had not been running the entire lap. You see, in that particular sport, which is largely based on the honor system, they had set up basically a one-mile course through the Phoenix area. And at what had been the starting line, that was also the checkpoint. That was the one-mile checkpoint. They'd given every runner a computer chip, and there was a computer chip reader at the starting line. And every time the runner would pass by that starting line, the chip would register that they had accomplished another mile. The problem is they had also, because of their suspicions about Agnew, they'd set up another chip reader at the half-mile point. They found it quite strange. That he was clicking off all these miles, but never crossing the half mile marker. They discovered that right after he was crossing the one mile mark, he would would come back through some trees and hide out. I'm not making this up. He would hide out in a porta potty. (laughs) And he would time himself so that he could come out of the porta potty, cross over the line again, and keep up with his roughly six and a half minute mile. In this sport that is largely based on a man or a woman's word, he seemed to be running like a champion. He had the trophies, the trinkets, the medals, and the certificates to prove it. But upon further examination, he was proven to be a fraud. I can't help but wonder if the Apostle Paul felt a little bit like that as he watched the Corinthian believers run this supposed Christian race. I mean, from a distance, it looked like everything was up to snuff. All seemed well, but on further examination, something wasn't right. Something was out of place. They seemed too comfortable in their sin, too steeped in their pride, too at home with the world. I mean, every Sunday, they came and they logged in at the church as if they'd run another mile of this journey of faith. But Paul is concerned they're not running properly. Maybe they're hanging out in a spiritual porta potty and just acting like they're doing something great for God. Now, to be clear, in the case of the Corinthians, Paul is not saying that they're not saved. In fact, in this very text, he says they've been washed, sanctified, and justified by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the process of telling them that they're not living right, he simultaneously reveals for us the fundamental difference between fake Christianity and real Christianity. 
And that distinction is very simple. The difference lies in the life that is being lived. As John MacArthur puts it as he comments on this text, a transformed life should produce transformed living. Paul is stating very strongly that it is unacceptable for believers to keep behaving like those outside the kingdom. Now, as we examine our own experience, did you hear me say our own experience? Not your husband, not your wife, not your children, not your parents, not your neighbor, not your Sunday school classmate. As we examine our own experience this morning, there are three things we need to scrutinize. Number one, let us look for flawed beliefs about your experience. Now, belief is very important if you're going to be saved. You can't be saved without right belief. Romans 10, 9 says, If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Acts 16, 31, Paul told the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Jesus told Nicodemus that you had to believe on God's only begotten Son. Jesus said, He who believes is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So belief is very, very important. May I remind you, however, that even the demons believe that there is a God. Is it possible that you are a professing Christian, but you've got flawed beliefs about your experience? Note what Paul says as he begins in verse 9. Do you not know? This is Paul's rhetorical technique of reminding them, hey, you know this. You will recall Paul spent a year and a half in the city of Corinth leading people to Christ, establishing this Corinthian church. He he knows that they know this because he taught them this himself. I I know you've heard these sermons, he says. I preached them to you when I was there. Do you not know, look at this, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. He indicates that some of them have a flawed belief about how they got saved and what happened when they got saved, if they got saved. And and we find here in the opening portion of verse 9 two things that we need to consider, two questions we need to ask and answer. Question number one, do you want deliverance without repentance? How will I know, preacher, that I've got a flawed belief about my salvation experience. Well, do you want deliverance without repentance? You see, Paul says, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. He appeals to a normal, natural, almost universal desire of people to inherit the kingdom of God, which in our context today will simply say to go to heaven. He says, do you understand the unrighteous are not on the pathway to heaven You say you want to go to heaven, but you want to cling to your unrighteous living. Do you not see those two are incompatible with one another? He says, in short, that the mere desire to go to heaven won't get you there. Any more than merely wanting to go to Disney World will get you to Orlando. Something's got to happen beyond your mere desire. The great black preacher E.V. Hill, who's now with the Lord, used to share his salvation testimony, and he would share it always the same way with an intentional use of humor. He would say, you you want to know Pastor Hill? Why did you receive Christ as your Savior? Well, he said there are a lot of reasons. Reason number one, I didn't want to go to hell. And everybody would laugh. He knew they would laugh, and he would say, you laugh as if that's a bad reason. He said, folks, I grant you that's not the best reason, but it ain't a bad reason either. I didn't want to go to hell. Now, I will agree with the great black preacher. That's not a bad reason. It's a very good reason. But listen carefully. It's also not a sufficient reason. It takes more than merely wanting to inherit the kingdom of God in order to inherit God's kingdom. A little boy wore a white seersucker suit to church, and when he got home, his mama knew his tendency was to go out and play in the yard and she said son don't you get out there in that mud puddle in the yard before you go inside and get that white suit off well he did what little boys will often do he didn't obey his mama she turned around and he's out there playing in the mud puddle in that white suit she said son I told you I warned you I cautioned you and now you're going to get a spanking man he began to cry big old crocodile tears I'm so sorry mama I'm so sorry mama I'm so sorry mama and she thought he was 
repentant. She said, okay, son, I won't give you a spanking. He said, oh, thank you, mama. Thank you, mama. She said, now let's go inside, get out of the mud puddle. Let's go inside and get cleaned up. And the little boy said, oh, you misunderstood. I wasn't sorry about the mud. I was sorry about the spanking. I think the aisles and altars of a lot of Baptist churches have been filled with people who weren't really sorry about the mud. They just didn't want a spanking. And Paul lowers the boom and says as bluntly as any preacher could, do you not know if you live an unrighteous life, you are not bound for the kingdom of God? I ask you today about your experience. Do you want heaven without holiness? Do you want reward without repentance? The question that is posed in verse 9 is one of many reasons why this church preaches what is called lordship salvation. That is, Christ will not save you without simultaneously becoming your Lord. Now, I've said this to you on many occasions, but it bears repeating. Don't ever, 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 folks, I'm talking about never say. Don't, don't, don't ever say this. Did you get the idea, don't ever say this? Don't ever say, I got saved when I was 8, but Jesus didn't become my Lord until I was 30. Now, I know what people mean when they say that. I really do. But that is as heretical and as blasphemous as it could possibly be. Jesus is not a bipolar schizophrenic with apologies to any that suffer with that terrible disease. Jesus is not Lord some of the time and Savior some of the time. He can't check His Lordship bag at the door and come into your life as Savior. If He came in as Lord, He came in to save. If He came in to save, He came in to rule. That's why He asked Himself in Luke 6, 46... Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say? One of the things you'll notice with some of the scriptures I'll share this morning is the contrast between what is said with the mouth and what is lived with the life. If you hear little else that I say today, listen very carefully. If you got a salvation that delivered you from hell without turning you from sin, that experience is as fake as a $3 bill and a $4 Gucci handbag. It won't last in the judgment. It won't get you into the kingdom of God. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you want deliverance without repentance? Second question, now we're talking about flawed beliefs. Do you want disobedience without rebuke? Do you notice the next statement that Paul gives? Do not be deceived. Now church, why does Paul say don't be deceived? It's because it's possible to be deceived. Deceived about what? Deceived about being able to live any way you want to live and still having the hope of heaven when you die. I don't have to tell most of you in this building this morning, we live in a day of deception in that regard. Modern liberalism has encroached upon the modern American church and created an environment where churches now formally and officially condone and embrace sin. You don't even have to leave this general region before you'll find mainline flagship denominational churches that will tell you you can be an unrepentant, ongoing homosexual and be right with God. That you can embrace abortion on demand and be right with God. That you can live in a same gender marriage and still be right with God. That you can be a transvestite or involved in transgender issues. That you can be involved in any manner of immorality and still be right with God. And Paul says, don't let anybody deceive you on that point. Now there are many of us in the buckle of the Bible belt. But we understand these things that I just mentioned are scriptural error. But let's be honest, in our own conservative subculture, many of us pick churches based on what I call the LCF, the least confrontation factor. Now, I don't expect you to embrace and condone sin, but I really don't want you mentioning any sins that might so easily beset me. You see, our flesh wants a cotton candy, feel-good, me-centered, lily-livered, weak-kneed kind of preaching that's more milk toast than Holy Ghost. Paul says, you need to get this straight. You are being deceived. 
Quit listening to that pagan at the workplace. Quit getting your advice from your lost crazy as a crazy as a bug cousin. Quit watching that prosperity gospel preacher on television. They are deceiving you. Do you want disobedience without rebuke? Paul prophesied the day would come. I submit the day has come in 2 Timothy 4. For well, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. By the way, do, do you notice when Paul talks about people who don't want to listen to sound doctrine, he doesn't call it some of us. He says, they. Yeah. The, 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 the group that doesn't want sound doctrine, it, it's not us. It's not backslidden us. It's they. Those outside the body, outside of the blood, outside of a right relationship with Jesus, outside of the body of Christ, they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, you know what they'll do? They'll hire them a pastor and build them a church in accordance with their own desires and physically, spiritually turn their ears away from the truth and willingly turn aside to myths. I've lived long enough, I've pastored and preached long enough to know some people would rather live with comfortable deceit than to have an uncomfortable, truthful rebuke. A person with a false conversion does not typically want to be confronted with truth. And a person who habitually does not want to be confronted with truth is typically a person with a false conversion. Do you get upset every time the preacher cuts a little too close to the corn? Do you get sideways every time there's a part of a sermon that gets in your business, in your stuff, and in your face? It may be that you want disobedience without a rebuke. And you want deliverance without repentance. It may be that you've got a flawed belief about that experience. Number two, don't just look for flawed beliefs, but look for fleshly behavior after your experience. Paul continues in verse 9 after warning us about deception and says, Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The bottom line is, he says, Corinthians, your life isn't matching your lip. Now, Paul's not ADD. He's not just scatterbrained. What he says here in these verses is connected to the passages we've been looking at our last several messages in this book. In chapter 5, he talks about a man who's living in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother and nobody wants to say or do anything about it. In chapter 6, they are at one another's throats down at the county courthouse. They are defaming the name of Jesus because their heart is filled with covetousness, their life is filled with pride, and their soul is filled with anger. And now he says, do you not understand That behavior is not characteristic of someone who has been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Ray Stedman comments here and writes, Paul is not saying that if you sue another believer you cannot be saved. Rather he is saying that if you have experienced Christian conversion, it should make a marked difference in the way you live your life. If it doesn't, then people have a right to question whether your conversion is genuine or not. We might say it like this. Paul says to the Corinthians, I say to Emmanuel, the problem is the tongue in your shoe and the tongue in your mouth aren't headed in the same direction. Your feet are going one way and your mouth is going another way. You're not walking the talk as well as you try to talk the walk. Was your salvation experience genuine? As we examine it, I want to caution you and urge you Look for fleshly behavior after that experience. Now, there are two things we need to consider on that question. Number one, is there a general character of sin? Is the general characteristic of your life prone toward sin? I do not believe, and most commentators do not believe, that in verses 9 and 10, Paul's trying to make a catalog of sins as if there's a checklist here and say, okay... The, these, these individuals, folks that do this, 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 th- this certain number of things, they're the ones not going to heaven, but everybody else is. No, he's talking about a general characteristic lifestyle. Please understand, the Bible does not teach sinless perfection for a believer. 
The, the day that you no longer deal with sin, they're going to put a tag on your toe and a wreath on the door, and they're going to be working out plans for your obituary. But as long as you live on this side of the dirt, we're going to be struggling with this thing called sin. But friend, when a, when a non-believer sins, they sin consistent with their nature. When, an, when a believer sins, we sin against our redeemed nature, and there ought to be a high level of discomfort. The Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, Christians now, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I once knew a man who testified within my own hearing, heard it with my own ears, that he had not sinned in 30 years. I'm going to say liar, liar, pants on fire. I really did think what a tragedy that you spend three decades in sinless perfection and then blow it all on a statement of pride. Won't everybody think that you've been sinless for 30 years? Folks, the only way that you go sinless, even as a Christian, for any length of time is if you have radically redefined what God calls sin. Yeah, you hadn't gossiped in a long time, but you sure have shared a lot of prayer requests. It's not greedy, preacher. It's just good business. No, it's called covetousness is what it is. So I'm not talking about sinlessness, nor is the Apostle Paul, but I am talking about holiness. In 1 John 1, 6, the Scripture says, If we say, do you see again, he's contrasting what you say with your mouth and what you do with your life. If we say that we're in fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Think about it. To say that you're walking with God while you're walking habitually in sin is to say that God is walking in that sin with you. That is an affront, a blasphemous attack on the character of our holy God. The Bible goes on to say in 1 John 2 and verse 4, the one who says, there goes the mouth again, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep, there's the feet, does not keep his commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. One of the best explanations of this truth is found in the writings of John, 1 John 3, verse 9. No one who is born of God practices. Would you say practices? I didn't say stumbles into. But no one who is born of God, nobody that is saved, practices sin. Why not? Because God's seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, there's reproductive language that is being used in this text. Uh, adults, go with me here in your mind for just a moment. The, the language here is describing the procreative process. With the, twice it mentions being born. In the middle of the verse, there's a reference to the seed. That part that the man contributes in procreation. Why is it that a person who's really been born again cannot habitually practice a lifestyle of sin, it's because through the glorious act of regenerating grace, you were born again, born of the Spirit with life from above. And in that transaction of grace, God didn't make you a new and improved version of your previously unimproved self. God didn't make you a 2.0 version of your pre-converted self. God made you radically, completely, wholly, and totally new. That's why the Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become new. You can't keep doing what you used to do because you're not what you used to be. You see, when you used to be lost and undone in your sin, you sinned consistent with your nature and it felt good. But as a child of God, when you sin, it is inconsistent with your redeemed nature and the Holy Ghost of God on the inside of you just flats get down inside of your business and won't let you be comfortable with the general character of sin. Think about a river generally flows from north to south. You get in a satellite view, and it looks almost as if that river makes a straight line from north to south. But if you get in a little twin-engine plane, fly over that about three or 4,000 feet, it'll look as twisted as a snake. It goes this way and that way and every way. 
That river that generally flows from north to south sometimes flows from south to north. Sometimes east and west, west to east. But its general direction is north to south. So it is in the life of a genuine child of God. We're going to have those moments our life flows briefly in the wrong direction. Could I get a witness? We're going to take a detour. Just like a river, sometimes we want the path of least resistance. The thing that's most comfortable in our life will do this, that, and the other. But the general course is toward God. Because Philippians 1, 6 says, He who began a good work in you will be faithful. Listen, even when you're not faithful, He who began the work in you, He will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So here's a good question. Is there a general character of sin? Now, I've already gotten on to this next question. Is there a godly conviction over sin? When people come to my office or speak to me as a pastor with doubts about their salvation, they will often say, I sin all the time. I say, well, get a ticket, stand in line, and join the club. The question is not, do you sin? The question is, how do you feel about it when you sin? You see, when you got saved, God did not wire you so that you could not sin. And God did not even wire you so that you could not sin and enjoy it. In fact, that's why you do it. That's why I do it. It felt good. I wanted to. It brought me pleasure. It brought me joy. What the Bible calls the pleasure of sin for a what? Season. You see, God didn't fix you so that you couldn't sin, didn't fix you so that you couldn't sin and enjoy it. But when you got redeemed, He fixed you so that you could not sin and enjoy it for very long. You'll have one of those stump out in the middle of the woods experience. I mean, when you turn off the phone and you turn off the iPad and you turn off the television, the Holy Spirit says, <clears throat> we got to talk. What you want to talk about, Lord? You. Your attitude. Your motive, your heart, what you said, what you did, where you went, what you looked at. I, I want to talk to you about you. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all Christians have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Do you know what an illegitimate child is? The King James uses a pretty hard word right there. Do you know what an illegitimate child is? That's somebody that the, 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 the talk is that so and so is their daddy, but that's not the truth. If you can sin without the chastisement of God, you can talk about God being all your father all you want to, but your talk doesn't make it so. In John 16, beginning in verse 8, Jesus, speaking of the Holy Spirit, said, And He, the Spirit, when He comes, will convict the world of sin. He will guide you into all truth. It's later in this very chapter that Paul says of believers that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now look right here. What that means is, if I'm genuinely saved, the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of me, and I take Him, the Holy Ghost, with me everywhere I go. I put Him in front of my phone, my iPad, my laptop, and He watches everything that I watch. And if you mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit is okay with me watching pornography, using His eyes to do it, using His hands to click over there, I'm telling you, you don't know the God of the Bible. When those things happen, the Holy Ghost on the inside of a believer says, I'm not comfortable in this environment. I want to get away from this lie. I want to get away from this greed. I want to get away from that bitterness. I don't want anything to do with that unforgiveness. Get me out of here. And when that wrestling is not happening down in your soul, crystal clear evidence that upon further inspection, the Holy Spirit is not at home in your heart. So as we examine our experience, there, there are just three things we need to look at and look for. We need to look for flawed beliefs about that experience. We need to look for fleshly behavior after that experience. Thirdly and finally, look for forgiving blood around your experience. You see, a real genuine conversion experience in some ways ought to look like a crime scene because it ought to be saturated with blood. You see, the story of salvation is really not a story about you, it's a story about Jesus. 
It's the story of what the hymn writer called the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Now, the story of your salvation might involve a buddy, it might involve a church, it might involve a vacation Bible school or a revival service, it might involve a preacher, it might involve an aisle, it might involve a closed eye, a bowed head, a whispered prayer, a raised hand, a baptistry, a filled out card, it might involve all of those things, but it is ultimately about two things. A sinner that realized I am undone in the sight of God and my only hope is Jesus. And that's the second thing, that God sent His one and only begotten Son to die on the cross in my place, bodily raised from the dead. And when I repented and believed, God saved me by His grace. Does your, does your salvation experience sound anything like that? Now, when you write the life song about your salvation, the specific lyrics may change from person to person, but the chorus ought to sound something like, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now when we come to verse 11, Paul gives clear indication. A genuine salvation experience is saturated with the forgiving blood of Jesus. Now there are two questions I want us to consider about this point. Number one, do you remember what you had been. Such were some of you. Folks, I don't know if there are five more beautiful words in all of the Bible. <laughs> Such were some of you. Is anybody glad to know you can be a sinner in the past tense? You can be hell-bound in the past tense. You can be enemy of God in the past tense. Such were some of you. Now, before Paul recounts the glory of their future, for some reason he wants to take them down memory lane. He wants them to look at the horrors of their past. And as he takes them on this little journey down memory lane, he wants to point out some of the dark, dingy, stinky, smelly alleyways where they used to live and what they used to love. Like the Apostle Paul, I fear that some of us, including your pastor, some of us have been under grace for so long we have forgotten what it's like to be doomed sinners both in nature and in practice. Before Paul talks to them about the glory of their salvation, he says, don't get too big for your spiritual britches. Such were some of you. Do you remember what you had been Paul lived in Corinth and preached there for 18 months. And so when he says such were some of you, I personally don't think he's speaking in the abstract or the theoretical. I, I think he knows these people in their life stories. I think he may have some folks in mind. He knew their story and doesn't want them to get too far away from the grace by which they've been saved. You see, one of the marks of a genuine Christian, especially one that is spirit-filled and walking in fellowship with God, is you never get away from the fact that the only way that you were saved is because one day you too were sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. You look good today, but there was a time you were very deeply stained within and sinking to rise no more. And the only way that you're in heaven's plan is because the lovely Lord Jesus Christ, the master of the sea, heard your despairing cry and from the waters he lifted you and now you're safe not because of you, but because of Christ one of the marks of genuine salvation is you never get too far away from a blood-soaked, sin-killing cross. Such were some of you. Do you remember what you had been? Quickly now, I want you to remember the context here. Paul's dealing with the fact that they're not forgiving one another. They're, they're taking one another to task and taking one another to court. And Paul says, here's a remedy for your interpersonal relationships. Fred... George, don't forget, y'all used to be in a homosexual relationship. And Justice and I went by your house on a Monday night. Knocked on the door. And you gave your life to Jesus. And by His grace, He cleaned you up and cleaned you off, gave you a right mind made you clean again in your thoughts and in your spirit and in your body. 
gave you a beautiful wife and some children, gave you a lovely bride and some precious children. God did all that for you, and now you won't forgive your brother over that contract dispute. Are you kidding me? Such were some of you. Sam, you used to chase every short skirt in town and slept with most of them. But one night a buddy invited you to the revival service over at the Emmanuel Baptist Church of Corinth. The gospel was preached. You came down and gave your life to Christ. God restored your family. You've got a beautiful wife. Your kids look at you with respect. You've got a good name in the body of Christ. And now you won't forgive your brother for the 200 bucks he owes you? Or have you lost your mind? And you, Sally... We all know what kind of lady you were in high school. You could hide it behind that bouquet, but you were four months pregnant when you got married. That baby wasn't born five months premature, nine and a half pounds. Come on. But not long after you married that baby's daddy, you got saved when you heard the gospel. And now, through the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been clothed in dignity. You've been robed in honor. You're no longer a woman of the night. You are now a woman with a heart after God. God did that for you. And now you won't forgive your mama for what she said about your daughter back at Christmas. Somebody here today may be struggling in a relationship because of what you know. Maybe you're struggling in a relationship because of what you've forgotten. Do you remember what you'd been? Lastly, do you recognize who you have become? Such were some of you. <laughs> you can sit there if you want to. I'll preach if I've got to preach it by myself. But you were washed. You were sanctified, but you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. It's obvious Paul has taken them back on this dark journey to the sins of yesterday. Just to contrast the blackness of our depravity against the brilliant glorious grace of Jesus. And he does so with three rapid repetitions of that word but. It's awkward in the English language but the Greeks would add it for emphasis. But... You were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. Now, to be honest with you, we'd say it like this. Hey, that's not who you are anymore. You've been washed by the blood of Christ. Hey, you've been sanctified. You've been set apart. God's got bigger, better plans for you than that old sorry, sinful lifestyle. Hey, you've been justified. God, in His sovereign mercy, has entered in a judicial statement on your behalf. You're not who you used to be. You're not what you used to be. God has radically transformed you. Do you recognize what you have become? Now, Paul's purpose here is not primarily to give a discourse on salvation. He wants them to remember they've been changed by the power of God. And there's only one answer for how that happened, and the answer is Jesus. You go back in the Old Testament, ask David, how do you get forgiven of murder? He'd say, Jesus. Ask Zacchaeus, how do you get forgiven of thievery? He'd say, Jesus. Ask Bathsheba, how do you get forgiven of adultery? She'd say, Jesus. Ask the woman at the well, how do you get forgiven for immoral living? She'd say, come meet a man who told me everything that I've ever done. Is this not the Christ? Ask Rahab, how do you get forgiven of harlotry? And she'll tell you about a scarlet thread of redemption that's an Old Testament picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. Ask Simon Peter, how do you get forgiven of lying and betrayal? And he'll tell you about a nail-scarred Nazarene carpenter named Jesus. Ask Paul, how do you get forgiven of blasphemy and false teaching? And he'll say, here's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. But I don't have to turn in my Bible, and Paul didn't have to turn in his Bible. He said, I don't have to call any of them to witness. I'll call some of y'all to witness. He didn't go back to Old Testament figures. I'm not going to either. I could just come over to this section right here and ask some of you, if you'd be honest, 
Who has hope for the homosexual? Somebody be able to say, it's the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. Who in this section knows that God can take a wicked sinner and clean him up by the blood of Christ and make him into a man of God, make her into a woman of holiness, and all across this building, every voice, every pew, every heart, every life would stand up and say, it's Jesus, 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 no other name but the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to clap their hands. Somebody ought to stand to their feet and lift their their hands to God and say, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm not what I used to be because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless his name. I want to ask you a question this morning. Has anything like that ever happened to you? I'm not asking, did you walk the aisle? Did you join the church? Did that happen to you? Let's bow in prayer. Father, may we each be able to leave this place saying, that's been my experience with Jesus. For some, it's in the past. But God, I pray we would live in light of it today and all of our tomorrows. But for some, that experience is to be had right now. Your word says now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. May that work of redeeming grace happen in this moment of mercy. In Christ's name I pray. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.